Hey, traders, this is Blake Morrow with Trader Summit. And I have Mr. Jim Welsh with us from Macro Tides. How you doing, Jim? I'm doing good, Blake. It's Friday and I'm talking to you. How can anything be better? <laughs> well, you know, I, I just want to say last week I had somebody mention in the comments about not having your website on the YouTube channel in the comments. Uh, so I had him add it last week. Hopefully it'll get added yep. again uh, this week. Yep. Um, so the sites up and running, macrotides.com. A lot of good information there. Go to it. A lot, lot of great information. Speaking of which, I, you know, I want to ask you about this week. This week was a kind of a, seemed like a weird week, but, you know, we're going out literally on the highs. You, you, I mean, I'm I'm looking at pretty bullish breakout in the NASDAQ right now. The S&P is almost at 4,400. I mean, what gives? We had a really yeah. crappy bond auction yesterday. Yeah, yeah, there was. And that's why we had kind of uh, the sharp reversal yesterday in the market. The thing I will note, Blake, is on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, each of those days, the S&P and NASDAQ 100, the Qs, were up modestly. If you look at what the Russell was doing, the equal weight S&P 500, the value line, they were down every single day. So, and there were more stocks down than up. So underneath the surface, there was weakness. And then you got the excuse of bond yields ticking up yesterday, putting pressure on the mega cap stocks. And now bond yields are down a little bit. So we're back to buying the mega cap stocks. And when we look at the chart of the S&P, I think we'll be able to put today's move up in, in the proper context. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm interested to see that, and I know we all are. So uh, ma matter of fact, if you guys and gals enjoy Jim's weekly review that he does here and also you know, uh, getting us ready for the following week, make sure you give him a big thumbs up and jump down in the comments below if you if you have any comments for Jim about any of the information he covers, because he's going to cover a lot. You know, speaking of covering a lot, so uh, we had the Fed chair. Uh, he he spoke at uh, uh, was it IMF or something. Uh, yeah, as an I well as an IMF panel discussion, and uh, you know right. we saw different central banks, different central bank governors uh, talk. But it seemed to have uh, he he seemed to really move the market, and then on that on top of the bond auction, what what gives? Well, a couple of things, as usual, and we've talked about this many, many times over the last probably eight, uh, 18 months, yeah. is that Powell will say something, Wall Street misinterprets it, and in, more often than not, that misinterpretation means the stock market rallies, and then he'll give a speech a week later, say the exact same thing, and it's like, whoa, he's way more hawkish than what we thought, and that's exactly what happened last week. I mean, when he gives these speeches, in his press conference, you can get a transcription of them. I get the transcription. I read through it. He was asked point blank. It sounded like a reporter said, it sounded like in your opening statement, Chair Powell, that you don't think monetary policy has reached the uh, proper restrictive level. And his answer was, yes, that's exactly right. Now, I don't know how much more clear you could get than that. And then other comments later throughout, you know, as he responded to other reporter questions, you know, kind of amplified that, that, all right, we're still tilted toward raising rates, right? Uh, which is what you and I talked about last week. I mean, again, I just read his transcript. He's telling us what he thinks. And so all of a sudden he gives a speech yesterday and it's, oh my God, he sounds so much more hawking. no. Not at all. I mean, he said exactly the same thing. But but so you had a bad auction. Yeah, the, the treasury market's on its heels. Oh my God, he didn't say anything to give us a you know a, an adrenaline push, and, and then so that you know it it went with the flow. Okay, yeah, but but yesterday, I mean, we sold off in equities. I, I mean, if you look at like the candlestick, for example, it was a bearish outside day. I expected to get up this morning to see the markets just under pressure. It's Friday. Everybody starts selling. And here we are, like literally trading at the week high uh, as we yeah. roll out on Friday. It, it's 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 an amazing uh, market we live in, right? It, it is. And to me, the decline that we saw from the high, uh, I guess, was it yesterday <laughs> on the S&P? Uh, you got up to 43.93. Well, that was a high from a few weeks ago. Yeah. So in Monday's weekly technical review, I said, OK, the odds are we're going to push up towards 4393. The 618 retracement is 4415. Yep. I believe there's a gap at 4101. The decline that and you'll see it on the chart when we talk about it 
looked like an ABC down and we held where it needed to hold. And so, yeah, to me, what this is, this move up today and maybe into early next week is likely the completion of the rally that began at 4104. And I think that's the first part of a larger up move. But I think this uptick today is going to and it follow through up towards, as I said, 4401, 4415. The odds are that's going to complete this initial surge. And then we will see a pullback in the S&P. Well, I, I'm excited to see your charts, Jim. Uh, so let's just go ahead and get into yeah. uh, the thing, the thing, all the information. Well, the one thing, you go know, ahead. we talked ahead, you know, about the bad auction. Yeah, yeah. Well, what made it a bad auction? All right. Well, what happened is that the tail, in other words, the spread, if you will, between the bid and ask of the, you know, how many bonds were being offered and how many people showed up to buy them. The spread was seven basis points. It's the worst since 2011. My guess is it's probably August of 2011, which is, people remember, I think it was on August 4th or 5th of 2011, S&P downgraded U.S. debt from triple A to, I think, double A plus or something like that. So it was, there was just more supply than the market was ready to handle. And and, and the tail's and so not good. I mean, the, the, the tail's like, that would be, quantified as a fat tail if i'm not if i got my yes. terminology correctly it's yes. like really wide okay and that's not a good that's not a good sign for the bond market but, but 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 we've we've shaken it off and the markets seem not to really care a whole lot today <laughs> well the other aspect and i almost put this chart in there uh blake is that the liquidity within the treasury market yeah. is terrible so when you get these outside moves and you start hitting stops uh, whether it's to the upside or the downside. Because a week ago, we hit a lot of stops to the upside, <clears throat> which added to the big move in treasuries. So the lack of liquidity is causing these swings to be more dramatic than they would be if liquidity was much higher. Uh -huh. So you had a confluence of events of last week causing a big surge. And I think the same, the opposite happened yesterday. Okay, well, let, let's get into the charts that you you brought uh, and, and talk about, uh, the macro backdrop, if you will, before yep. we get into the technicals. And again, if you uh, if you have any comments for Jim or uh, anything that you, you you're questioning on his uh, on some of the data that it's br that he's bringing to the table, uh, make sure you jump in the comments below. So uh, the yep. first um, uh, chart you brought here is tighter lending equals negative credit growth equals a recession. Now we've heard yep. recession. It's funny. I, and I let me let me interrupt you really quick, Jim. I um. I, I was on uh, YouTube, which I, I do spend a lot of time on YouTube. Yep. I watch podcasts and, um, you know, and, and, and whatnot. We publish a lot of our work there too. I, I saw a, a thumbnail of some experts uh, calling recession a year ago. It said, you know, one year ago and it, you know, the, the video just yep. automatically pops up and I'm like, Huh, that one didn't age too well. But you've been uh you you've been you've been saying for a, for a really a long time, uh, we're not really in a technical, we're not in a recession, not yet. We're gonna be in one. So how tell us what this chart means and how close are we to getting into one? Yeah, one comment to kind of preface it. Again, to me, combining fundamental analysis with technical analysis. Uh, is really, really helpful and has been. And so last year, when everybody was thinking about a recession, as you know, I said, no, no recession. Now everybody's gone 180 degrees. Hey, we don't have to worry about a recession. GDP was up 4.9%. And you know what I've been talking about is there's these long range indicators that have had a great success ratio of predicting a recession. But things like the yield curve, the average lead time is 19 months. So you, 12 months ago, you had people, oh my God, we're going to go into recession and uh, look at the yield curve. Uh, hey, do some homework, folks. It's 19 months. Which is a so, year and a half, folks, just for, you know, for- And you know, guess what? On average. The yield curve inverted, it was, I think, July of last year. Hello, we're kind of coming up right to that 19 month window average yeah. a time when we've had decent data as we showed a couple of weeks ago in 2007 in the third quarter gdp was up 4.9 percent exactly what it was this year so things can and have often turned on a dime all right so um here's leading uh kind of a leading indicator 
is tighter lending standards. So again, think about what that means. The Fed hasn't really been doing much. Uh, I mean, they've been incrementally increasing the funds rate over the last nine months. You know, not, and then spacing out the increases. And now we've gone, I think, two or is it three meetings now without a rate increase. All right. But during that same window of time, banks have been tightening lending standards. So what does that mean for small companies, which are totally dependent on the banking system to, to raise money? Because they're not going to be able to issue bonds in the bond market. That's not what small companies do. And they employ more than half of the people in this country. Well, they're dependent on the bank and the banks not only have now they're paying 10 percent for a loan is what the average small company is paying. And the amount of their credit lines has often and probably shrunk a little bit, given what we're seeing. So as liquidity stops flowing to the small business sector, Blake, it causes a pullback in economic activity that ultimately results in higher unemployment rates. So this indicator basically shows in blue the senior loan officer opinion survey that the Fed just put out this week. Better and known as the SLUs. Yeah, SLUs. Yeah. They yeah. advanced in this chart, they advanced then actual lending in the orange color. Uh, the SLUs is advanced 12 months. So it kind of says, okay, this is where we're going, folks. And so you can see where lending is at, is at about a minus 20, the SLUs are at a minus 45 or whatever that number would be. So we're going to continue to see a contraction in lending to small businesses, medium-sized businesses. And historically, what you can see is when that happens, you get a, a slowdown slash recession. And I have some of this stuff goes on, and we've talked about it sometimes going back to the mid-60s. So this has been very reliable, but the lead time... It's 13 months. Well, when did most of the increase happen? Well, it started in the third quarter of last year. Mm, 13 months, here we are. So this is another indicator that to me, people maybe thought about for five minutes and then, oh, well, we didn't get a recession. So that thing's not worth anything. No, right. it's about to become, I think, very worth it. So, okay. All right. Well, that, that's that, um, that we definitely need to take note of that. Now, the next chart you brought is lending, uh, tighter standards. lending standards again. Again, with what happens to the S&P. Why? Because when you get tighter lending standards, ultimately you get an economic slowdown, recession, earnings get hit, multiples get contracted, and the S&P goes down. So we can see there, you know, significant uh, increase in lending standards. We had a pretty, uh, you know, big decline in 2022. We've had a recovery. I think potentially that rebound ended in late July at 4607. And I think the the bulk of the impact on the economy is coming in the next three to six months. And right now, Wall Street's expecting earnings to be up 12%. If they're wrong and earnings not don't go up 12%, but actually reverse and go down, next year, in the first half of next year, Blake, I think the S&P could be pretty ugly. So this is where, you know, combining fundamental analysis, not listening to Wall Street, because invariably, honestly, folks, I've been doing this a long time, and the stuff that they put out is superficial. And I, as I like to say, there's always a bull market in herd mentality on Wall Street. They all say the same thing. Why? Because job insecurity is high. So again, to me, technically now, what we're trying to do is identify we're going to get this rebound. And when that rebound ends, I think that's when the S&P is going to be vulnerable as we get into next year to a fairly big size decline. Okay, well, well, and I'm going to stop here. I want to ask you something really quick because I don't think you have anything regarding this. So I want to just ask your opinion. And I, I'm sure I asked you this time last year, but where are you at on seasonality? I mean, we, you know, a lot of people are attributing this, you know, this rally to seasonal factors, the NASDAQ that's like, it's, it's uh, I, I was meeting with uh, another um, uh, analyst that I, I meet with mm -hmm. every week. And he just says, you know, NASDAQ for the last, you know, X amount of many years, you know, 70% of the time is higher in November. I mean, we are in a seasonally good time to be in the markets, right? Yeah, we are. And the thing about any of these statistics, you know, there's great cocktail conversation. Well, do you know that 71% of the time the NASDAQ goes up, blah, 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 blah. Okay. 
Right. But what about the other 29, 30% when it doesn't? So it's kind of like uh, the sign says I can walk. So I'm going to cross the street. I'm not going to bother to look to see if any cars are coming and whether they're going to stop. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes the car doesn't stop and you get run over and, yeah. you, and you know, you, you're dead. You go up to heaven, ideally. And St. <laughs> and St. Peter says, Jim, how'd you get here? What happened? Well, I was crossing the street and the sign said walk. And I walked and some idiot ran me over. And St. Peter says, Jim, did you look both ways like your mother taught you? <laughs> oh, I just looked at the sign. All right. So the sign is saying 70% of the time the NASDAQ is going to go up. That's great. But I want to have proof on the ground in terms of what I'm looking at uh, based on price charts, momentum, and all the rest of it to, in a sense, validate that yeah. outlook. Okay? okay. It's that simple. So, uh, you know, a week and a half ago when we talked or two weeks ago, I said, I think we're going to get a rally. I think the S and P could go to forty three fifty five. Uh, did I think it was going to happen in a week? No, but technically things were set up, and the Nasdaq has been the strongest index. So if we do indeed, and I think there's more upside, as I said earlier, the Nasdaq will likely continue to lead. Um, I recently I did a call yesterday with a group of financial advisors, Blake, and each month I go through all, like the eleven sectors of the S and P and their relative strength to the S and P. There was only one out of the 11 that had positive relative strength, technology. Yeah. So basically, you've got this pyramid that's upside down. The whole market's depending on this one group, technology. Um, I think that tech, the tech sector is going to get hit next year. All and right. It does. And if the economy is slowing or going into recession, the other sectors aren't going to pick up the slack. That's yeah. That's that's the, that's the scary. It doesn't work that way. Right. You know? So, All right. Well, let's uh, yeah. let's get back into this uh, yield curve inversion unwind. Uh, tell us a little bit about this chart here. OK, so the yield curve inversion is when either the three month or two year uh, Treasury rate uh, goes um, ab above the 10 year because a normal yield curve is the short term rates, you know, like T-bills and two year. It's upwardly sloped. OK, yeah. so that's a positive yield curve. Well, when it inverts. It means the short-term rates are going above the long-term rates. And that is the 19-month historically average signal that, okay, down the road, there's going to be a recession. What ha happens as you near that recession, all of a sudden, longer-term rates start to come down before the Fed cuts the funds rate. So the short-term rates are uh, anchored to the funds rate, like the one and two-year and three-month treasury uh, bill rate. Yeah. And so what we've seen, obviously, is the 10 year went from what, from 5% to under four and a half. Right. So the yield curve uninverted and historically, whenever it's been more than 1% of an uninversion, that you're on the doorstep of a recession. So this chart goes back to, you know, late 1960s. And you can kind of see each of the times when you had this uninversion. Uh, take place in the yield curve. Now, with yield, you know, the, the yields have ticked higher the last couple of days, um, but the signal is the signal. And so to me, we're getting closer and closer to the point in time where we're going to see more and more data points say, wait a second, things are indeed slowing. And, um, you know, so to me, this is just another macro view that reinforce, you know, so what I'm looking for, okay, Jim thinks the economy is going to slow a lot in the next three to six months. Well, is that just Jim's opinion or can I actually base it on something um, that has some historical value? This is one of those charts. That's why I think it's important. It is important. And one of the things I want to know, I highlight here, and, and even though you see that uninversion taking place, it, you still might have some time. It, it's happening now. Right. But there's there still could be a couple months. Uh, oh, uh, easily. Uh, oh, yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But now we've gone from a 19 month lead time, you know, in terms of the yield curve signal. Yeah. And now all of a sudden now we're, you know, three to six months at most, which to me ties in with a lot of the other things you and I have talked about over the last couple months. So uh, this is just, again, one more piece of evidence. Now, again, the whole point here is Wall Street doesn't share this view. Wall Street thinks the economy is going to avoid a recession. Earnings are going up 12% next year. 
So uh, if they're right, okay, market will probably be fine. But if they're wrong, and I think it's hard to imagine, you just had the biggest increase in the funds rate in 40 years. Lending standards have tightened the fastest in the last 40 years. Yeah. So Wall Street last week, Blake, came to the conclusion, oh, gee, thank goodness, the Fed's probably not going to raise the funds rate another 25 basis points, so we don't have to worry about a recession. I mean, to me, that just sounds pretty stupid. In other words, oh, if they were going to go one more 25 basis points, that would be kind of worrisome. And we're going to ignore the 500 basis points <laughs> they've already but, done. But now yeah. we're going to be fine. All right. Well, we're going to um, be okay. Yeah. All right. The, it looks like you brought one more chart for evidence. Yeah. Uh, this That's is bankruptcies. Fine. Yeah. So, okay. The GDP was up 2%, a little bit over 2% in the first and second quarter, up 4.9% in the third quarter. So the average, I think, is around 2.7. And you can see you got more bankruptcies happening this year than any time since 2010. Now, that sounds like a booming economy to me, Pilgrim. Do you remember that that ref, yeah. movie reference? Uh, um, um, I I I know it because I can. Jimmy Stewart. I hear the. Tell me, Lee Marvin. Tell me, Woody Strode. Uh, who shot Liberty Valance? Oh, okay, all right. No, I didn't remember that one. Bill I remember Brown? the line. That, that's though. John Wayne's. Well, it's a John Wayne. John. That's it. It's John Wayne. All John right. John Wayne's sorry. line to all right. Pilgrim. So, so what anyway. you're trying to what you're trying to explain here is basically bankruptcies going up like this is not indicative of a strong economy. It, it it's actually exactly right. exactly. And so. again, commercial real estate, <laughs> I think it's going to be very problematic next year. Yeah. Um. And but right now that's not on anybody's mind or radar. Uh, but if the economy slows materially, what typically happens is weak hands get weaker, and some of them go bankrupt. More of them go bankrupt. We're yeah. already seeing that happening, and we haven't even gotten to the meaningful slowdown yet. All right. So, well, well um, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you think is going to happen in some of these markets because I look at the dollar, and uh, I'll be—I'm going to just tell you, the dollar is pretty. I don't want to say it's confusing. But it's definitely mixed. Um, and one of the things I will point out here, just because I look at the dollar so uh, uh, so much yeah. and I, my focus is really there, we're really at this major, you know, 106 level. Yeah. It's it's a big pivot. It's been a big pivot in the market for a long time. W yeah. Which way is the dollar going to go? Because I got my I got my horse. I got my bets on a certain horse. And uh, sure, tell sure. me if I'm going to be right or, or not. Hopefully, it's Sea Biscuit. Um, <laughs> so to me, what the chart looks like is yeah. an ABC down. So in other words, we had this big move from under 100 up to 107. All right. And, you know, you've got three waves down to the little letter A, three waves up to the B, and you had this drop into the low over the last handful of days mm -hmm. for what looks like wave C. So to me, that low that we saw, which was at 104.85, that's pretty important because that, in my take, is supports that we're going to see one more push up in the dollar index and it will get above the 107.34, which was the high back in uh, September, I believe. And that then, I think, will complete the whole move up from last July's low. And my take here, Blake, is I think, you know, why is the dollar rallied so much? Well, last summer, people were, oh, my God, we had just had the regional bank crisis. The economy is always oh, terrible. Oh, my God. And they were wrong about that. So, whoa, whoa, wait, we're getting good data. Oh, that means the Fed's going to stay on hold. They're going to maybe even keep raising rates. Dollar rallies like, like it did. All right. Yeah. And to our credit, we were bullish at the lows. Uh, saying the rally was going to be coming from at least under 100 to 104, and then we worked our targets up. So what causes that change? If I'm right about the economy slowing meaningfully in the first half of next year, I think the dollar is going to weaken. And my guess is next year, let's say it gets up to the 109 uh, area, 110, um, and that's just a guess in it. It just needs to get above 107.34 to complete the pattern, I think. I think it's in the first half of next year, it will drop back down to the 100. So a pretty meaningful decline is coming. I just think we have the potential 
for one more push up here um, between now and the end of the year. I think you talked about seasonality. I think historically, um, seasonality going in year end is beneficial for the dollar. But the key is staying above that 104.85, uh, yeah, yeah. I would say, on a closing basis. Uh, otherwise, something else is going on. Um, and that would imply that you are going to see a deeper pullback in the dollar. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, I, Jim, I think it's going to be really fascinating to watch because I do, uh, agree with a lot of what you're saying as far as a a recession goes and the way the markets are going to respond, but the dollar tends to be a safe haven type of, uh, currency. Uh, so yeah. I think, you know, it's it's going to be really interesting to see if the dollar actually sells off or if it if it strengthens, I guess it's. Uh, well, it's, if the Middle know. East blows up more, I get that, you know, that would be one backdrop that has nothing to do with the economy. But right. state haven status that you just brought up fits in. Yeah. Um, you know, again, this is trying to intersect the outlook for the economy, which I think is reasonably uh, well thought out. And how that will relate back to the dollar index. Right. And, it, you know, looking for that rally, hey, part of it was the economy's not going into recession yet, you know. Um, so given the correlation between economic strength in the U.S., especially relative to Europe, which is likely already in a recession, um, I, I think, if I'm right, the, the dollar's setting up for, uh, you know, a, a greater period of weakness next year. Interesting. Okay. Well, the next chart you brought is gold. Um, I somehow got uh, 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 sucked into listening to a little bit of Peter Schiff, and uh, he told me that uh, gold is going to five thousand. So, what do you think? Uh, I, I'll. My mom said, "Don't say anything about anybody if you're not going to say something nice." So, therefore, <laughs> I can't say anything about Peter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So we've talked five up from the lows last year to the high in May. We were looking for a wave two pullback. The expectation was that it would ultimately make it below 1850. We had this big, strong move up. I think that's wave one of the next advancing wave. So in other words, the bull market to me was signaled when we had five waves up into that May high. We got a wave two pullback. I think we're in the early stages of wave three, one up, two down, and those are some targets. Um, So uh, I I think you want to be looking to be a buyer of gold on this weakness. And again, it ties in potentially with the dollar. If the dollar has a pop, I could see where gold can drop. Now, if it's due to, you know, worse things happening in the Middle East, they both of them go up on that news. But my take, again, is that if I'm right about the dollar, uh, the Fed having to cut rates as we get deeper into next year, I think gold is going to move above the 2070 ceiling, which is kind of knocked on it three times. Yeah, I think it's going to blow through that. And 20, you know, 2300 seems like a reasonable uh, target for gold uh, next year. All right. All right. Well, it it did it it's pulled back a little bit, but it sure is uh, holding up. Matter of fact, I I know it's not here, but I will say that really close to where we're at is the 38% retracement of this move. So, we're getting Yeah. So, so support. basically for, you know, people weekly technical review, back on October 13th, I said, okay, time to buy it, and I thought we were going to get a move above 2008 to complete that rally, but just in case I was wrong, I had to stop uh in um it got hit at 1965 because we took out the prior low so i'm looking basically to okay try to identify the low of this pullback because i think what comes next uh, and again this could dally you know for handful weeks and depending on if indeed the dollar goes above 107.34 you know gold could pull back deeper to the numbers that we just talked about Okay. All right. Next chart you have is the TLT. Tell us what is happening here because I, I think we hit some pretty key resistance this week. <laughs> um, and then uh, we've had all these auctions and the market's obviously yeah, yeah, paying yeah, yeah. close attention to them. So, Okay. So to me, the low at 82.42 represents the completion of the decline from March of 2020. It's hard to believe. TLT was 179 and change wow. in March 
2020. So it's that was, decline, it's that's decline way up here somewhere. I think it's off the screen. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> you know, it's out there somewhere, right? So think about that. A decline of like 55%. So now we're talking about, all right, what kind of retracement? Well, minimum retracement would be, about, I think, a two, uh, 238. So call it 20% of 55%. And what does that get you? It, it gets you a decent move higher. Uh, I think a 382 is up around 119. Way four of lesser degree is between 105 and 109. So that's why I think potentially next year, economy slows down. People anticipate the Fed's going to cut rates. The liquidity in the treasury market is poor. Once institutional buyers, insurance companies, pensions, have some real confidence that, hey, the peak in rates is behind us, they're going to jump in and buy these bonds. Okay. So five up from the lows of last uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so to me, that's another if you will, check mark in the box of a oh, low has been put in. You know, two, three weeks ago, we talked about a lot of things. There was an intermarket divergence, RSI divergences, a two-day key reversal on October, I think, 23rd, um, and so forth. Now we got five up. So to me, the evidence is mounting that we indeed have seen a significant low. We've got five up for, I think, the first part of the advancing wave, looking for a pullback. And you never know how, I mean, wave twos can complete like, you know, pull back like 98% of wave one. So you never know for sure how deep a wave two will go. And that's why to me, it made sense. Okay, I got five up. We're going to get a pullback. And I sent a special report out on uh, Wednesday, take some money off the table at 89.20. And lo and behold, we get a, a bad auction. <laughs> I mean, this right. is where sometimes the technical stuff, Blake, is really pretty cool. Yeah. You know. I mean, I, you know, it, hey, it's acting great on Wednesday. Look at it. It's popping, man. Uh, just took out the prior high. Oh, right, yeah. right here, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, again, this is the intersection between technical and fundamental stuff. So, uh, I think potentially that sharp drop we saw yesterday is probably wave A of two. Bounce today for two, maybe into Monday. I think there's another leg down. In other words, it'll do an ABC pullback, and it'll get under 86 I think the 618 retracement is down around 85, 17 or something. I don't know. It's down there. So, um, again, this is another market where it's like, all right, where do we buy back the half that was sold yeah. at 89, 20? Uh, because I think as we get into next year, TLT is going to have a pretty good move um, to the upside. If indeed the economy slows, the prospect of Fed rate cuts become realistic. Um, you know, it's going to rally. That's what happens. Yeah. All right, Jim. Well, uh, let's talk, uh, last but not least, let's talk about stocks because the stock market is pretty damn strong right now. I mean, yeah, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're looking at us closing at the highs of the week. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So to me, looking at the decline from the 4393 that was reached yesterday morning yep. and then dropped to 4343, it kind of looked like an ABC. If you look like a 30 minute chart, sometimes that's what you have to do to see, okay, what happened underneath the surface yesterday? Um, it looked like ABC down. And so to me, we were likely to have another pop that takes us above 4393. As we talked before, I think there's a gap at 4401. 4415 is the 618 retracement. So I think you can push up into that range. Then I think there's a pullback coming uh, in the S&P. I think potentially down to 4250, maybe a touch below for a wave B and then wave C higher. If so you close what, below 4216, what? you close below 4216, that would really greatly diminish. Okay. Yeah, you know, we kind of increase increase the probability the rally is over. All right. So that's what I'm operating under is okay, you get a pullback, look to be a buyer. Um and if you want to be a scalp, look to go short above 43.93. And then, um, you know, we'll see what shows up on the downside. And, and I want, and, and I just want to, out of curiosity, Jim, let's say you're wrong here and we just go a little, we start breaking out higher above the 44.15 resistance you were just talking about. What happens to your account then? Um, well, again, the, the basic idea here is that we're in a retracement rally relative to the, the decline from late July, all right? Yeah. So now I'm just trying to put fine, you know, 
fine tune it. And so to your point, in my opinion, it, it doesn't change anything. In other words, ultimately, I think the S&P can get up to 4,500. How it gets there sometimes is the mystery, you know, and I'm outlaying or laying out a path that to me makes some sense at this point in time, a little more strength, a pullback, another push higher. Now, what would change my view is if we, you know, we do the a little bit higher pullback, go up for what looks like wave C, then get another little pullback that doesn't overlap 4393. And then you go up again so that, wow, from 4104, now we can count five waves up. That would change my viewpoint. Um, and it would open the door for a couple other out, uh, outcomes. Um, but, you know, you got to have a game plan. This is what it looks like right now. Look at the bottom bottom panel. Is an you know, MACD on the S&P's RSI. Yeah. It's pretty overbought. Right. So if you look back. You know, what happened in, you know, the prior rallies, you know, going back to June and July, you know, it's like, okay, you got at least some kind of a pullback when you got this overbought. Yeah. And so, you know, to your point, could it do that? Just keep running? Absolutely. That indicator kind of says the, the probability of that happening in the very near term is lower. That said, next week is Thanksgiving week. Is it next no. Week? no, no, no. Yeah, next week, right. next week is CPI week. week. CPI never week. week. Yeah, yeah. Now that's interesting. I did, I was going to put a chart in there. Um, health medical care. Uh, they do a, an annual adjustment in October. Over the last year, it subtracted two point seven percent from the CPI. So that's what twenty some basis points a month. It's going to add about fifteen to twenty basis points starting in October. So you're going to see a big flip from that component. Now in the CPI, it's about eight and a half percent in the PCE, which is the favorite of the fed it's over 22%. So the point being is I think the PCE, when we get that at the end of November, that may not go down as much. I think the CPI is going to drop a little bit more. The takeaway value from last year, I think is 0.2. So you know, I think the CPI will drop a little bit from what, 3.7, maybe it drops to 3.5. Not great, but hey, in the right direction. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, that's getting a little wonky. But, uh, but you know, again, that's I like doing that kind of stuff to try to get a leg up. Well, speaking of leg up, uh, next week, we're going to have we're going to do our filming a day early. So uh, just one prepare everybody for that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Jim, I want to say thank you so much for spending your time here on the Traders Summit. If you guys and gals really like what Jim does, make sure you give him a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel down below so you don't miss any of this very exclusive content. Jim, I, I truly do appreciate you. I hope you have a great weekend Thanks, and uh, make same, sure. Buddy. Yeah, visit Macrotides and uh, let them know. Macrotides.com. Yeah, Macrotides.com. And you saw yeah. it here. So let them know. All right. All right. Thank you, Blake. Have a good one, buddy. Thanks, Jim. You too. Hey, traders. Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, click the bell notification so you do not miss any of our market-related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.